you all for coming, for being with us this weekend. Um, so first of all, I'd like to introduce Alex Ben Locke, who's the senior editor with Hollywood Reporter, who's going to be conducting the Q&A session tonight. And then I want to welcome Black or White's uh, director and writer, Mike Binder, who worked with Kevin Costner on the upside of Angler, as you'll know. Mike? And lastly, the Oscar-winning actor, Kevin Costner, <laughs> who has something like 40 films to his credit. And thank you for being here. <laughs> you say Thank you so much, everybody. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this movie as much as I did. You know, uh, I see a lot of movies in my job, and at one time I was actually a movie critic. And uh, I've come to really appreciate movies that have explosions in them that have nothing to do with explosives, that have to do with emotions, that have to do with human life, not with robots, not with special effects but movies that really move you and touch you and take you up and down as this movie did. And I think that's why it's so special. And so uh, as we talk about it, I want you to know my intent is simply to dig a little more deeply into this because it's exactly the kind of movie that I think AARP and all of the folks here want to see. Movies for grown-ups that really are about grown-up topics. And this is one of those. I, think it's, I actually think it's a very important movie. So let's get right into it, because we have uh, two very talented individuals here who made it possible. Uh, Mike, maybe I'll start with you a little bit. Just tell me, uh, this project, where did it really come from? This was something you said you had in your head. Uh, can you tell us just how it came to be? I will. First of all, I want to thank the AARP group and everyone for having us here tonight. Thank everyone for coming. Uh, and appreciate the reaction to the movie. Um, it was, it was based on a true story in my life, and, and, uh, and uh, I have to say it became an incredible collaboration between Kevin and I, and really uh, was something that I had in my head for years, and I wrote it, and I sent him the script, and I had sent him quite a few other scripts after Upside of Anger that he liked, he claims, but didn't quite speak to him. <laughs> And then uh, I, I sent him this one through JJ, his, his manager, who was a great supporter of mine and obviously his for many, many years. So we did it the movie. We lost. We lost it right, right as we were finishing. And, uh, but it was basically my, my wife and I were, were, I helped my wife as she raised a biracial nephew of hers when her sister died suddenly at 32. And he was seven years old. And, he also had a family down in South Central, and we lived in Santa Monica. And he did his father wasn't in his life at all, which really was such a loss to me. And, and uh, he's still in our life. He's still a huge part of our family. But it was really, the two worlds always spoke to me as a way to maybe tell an interesting story about the whole dynamic of, of family and race. And, uh, you know, it just, and it just came together. And, Thankfully, he really got this, the idea. Well, before we get to that, one of the things that is that you took it out to some studios and uh, possible distributors, and it wasn't an easy sell, was it? Well, I didn't. No, I never did. I, I never, I, I, no. I, 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 I did. He did. I, oh, okay. I, I, read this, I wrote the script, and it was really right out of my printer. I gave it to JJ. I said, just tell me if you think this is some, an area Kevin wants to go in. Don't give it to him. And, a couple of days later, he called me and said, I'm going to do this. We're going to do this. You and I, I'm, we're going to produce it. And, and then he'll give you the rest. Cause he, yeah, ran, he ran with the ball. I never took it to him. Kevin, yeah. tell me what you saw in that script that, uh, that touched you. Well, uh, first off, I, I want to, all the little cameras that you're holding, I'd really like to send that to my wife because she says, what are you doing down there in LA? <laughs> <laughs> what? We live in the Santa Barbara. You're, you're, you're doing what on Sunday? Yeah. So these cameras gonna come in real handy where I was at. I'm, at. I'm with our own kind, Mom. Um, yeah, this this came the the, the movie. Uh, I I I appreciate it. we 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 just snuck in here and we we heard you understand what we were trying to do. And so there's no greater pleasure to sit up there and. 
have you guys laugh at the right spots, tear up at the right spots, and actually see yourself maybe in certain scenes in the, in the right spots. And that was really gratifying for us to see that. And I believe that when I read this movie, I believe that it, it helped me uh, understand this very delicate conversation that we are all having trouble with. And um, I thought, oh, I said, I thought, oh my goodness, everybody's going to love this. I, 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 the studios will like this. Is this is what we're looking for? This is the kind of movie that I just love, and it's highly, highly entertaining. And I said, Mike, we're going to make this. I promise you, we're going to make this. And of course, the door shut like they do in a fairy tale. <laughs> click, 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 click. Where did Mother Hubbard go? What happened? I. And you went to the major studios and they just... They just they, it just was not going to happen. But my problem was I had promised Mike with my big mouth that we would do this. And in the world I live, I make cowboy movies. And I knew that I had to make this. I said we would make it. And so I, I walked down uh, the hall to my wife and I, I said to her, I said, listen, I think we're going to make uh, Black or White. She said, what? We're going to make it? I said, yeah. She goes, why did you walk down the hall to tell me that? What, do you, what does that mean, we're going to make it? And I said, we're going to pay for it. And she looked at me, and I said earlier today, which I guess it was like Field of Dreams, and I said, I'm going to build this field and tear down my corn. Um, I said, we're going to make this movie about this movie about what this, these emotions. And my wife said, Let's, then let, if you believe in this movie that much, then that's what we should do. And that's my story, you know, and I believe in the movie. <laughs> of course, that makes the terrible rule of Hollywood, which is OPM, always use other people's money. <laughs> that's right, I, and I, you know, but I've done this before. I did it with Dances with Wolves. I, I've done it. I, you cannot fall out of love with the things that you fall in love with. And so I had seen this movie and it was important to make it. Now we have, and for regardless of what happens in the world of business, I did what I was supposed to do. And, and, and Michael did what he's supposed to do as a writer, director. He just keeps at it. And that's what we do. And we have a strong connection with people that pay money that go to the movies. This is for you. I, 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 I just want to tell you a funny, you will appreciate this funny footnote to this, is that when I met Kevin years ago, I was sitting at the Bomb restaurant, and uh, I was waiting for my agent, and and he walked up to me, he said, and he, and he was, to me, my, one of, maybe my favorite actor, I love Field of the Dreams, Bill Durham, and, and he just said, hey, can I, excuse me, can I introduce myself to you, I really like your stand-up comedy, and uh, I said, wow, thanks. And he said, I'm waiting for my agent. Can I sit down and say hello for a minute? I said, uh, yeah, of course. I sit down. And we were talking. I said, so what do you do? And he goes, I just made a movie that I think is going to kill my career. I put all my own money into it. It's called Dance with the Wolves. And they're calling it Kevin's Game. And he was just saying, he was real low about this movie. This, he said, I've been working my butt off on it. And, and, uh, and I, I told him I had my first movie coming out. We talked. And, Turned out to be, as you, as you said, you said, you claimed that it was going to win the Oscar, but he, 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 he I had to met him on a day, it must have been one of the lowest days of the whole journey for him, because he was so sure it was done. Kevin, you have uh, many scripts presented to you, and you have many choices, even with other people's money. Uh, but this script also uh, has a social and political content that speaks to a lot of things going on in our world today. Was that a message you wanted to get out, or was that a challenge to scare you a little bit? Well, I'm not in the business of making message movies, but sometimes you just feel like something changes you a little bit. I mean, I love baseball, right? But I didn't, I didn't know what America's fascination was with baseball until James Earl Jones told us in Field of Dreams. It was a magical speech. And, and I know what honor is, but I didn't know what it was like until I saw Spencer Tracy, you know, talk about inherit the win and talk in that courtroom sequence, and and, and uh, you know Gregory Peck and the Kellen Mockingbird. Occasionally, 
we get to hear things and that maybe we never forget the rest of our life. Maybe they help inform us. And when I saw the courtroom, I, I, I thought that number one, I knew it helped me in this conversation. I was born in Compton, um, California. Actually, I was born in Linwood, the little hospital, but I lived in Compton. And Michael wrote this movie about these two worlds. And I know a little bit about both of them now. Um, and I just, um, I didn't feel that this was brave to do. I felt that this was something I should do. Um, I don't operate with a lot of fear. Fear is what guys have to have in Afghanistan and Iraq. Those guys have fear. I shouldn't have fear conducting my own artistic career. I don't have to conduct my life based on what a movie does on opening weekend. I don't give a shit. I have, I have an ego and I would like my movies to be really successful. I'd like them to blow up, of course. But I can't let that inform me of how to live my life and the choices. Because if I did, I would walk past this little movie that now is a part of my film history. And I'm glad for one that you saw it. Yeah. A couple of minutes ago, we talked very briefly, and you mentioned that you went and fought for this movie to get the right rating on it, that they wanted to slap an R rating on it. Why was it important to you to get a PG-13 rating? Well, it, you know, it was, uh, that was going to happen to us. We had the one motherfucker in it. And it's, and it's very appropriate. It's a, it's a lawyer who's tired of me. But he also identifies at that very moment when he's really upset with me, he also lets us know that maybe Elliot isn't a drunk. Maybe Elliot is just angry. That, that, that the two women that are closest to him in his life are gone. And the last connection he has is this little girl. And if she's taken from him, and what that does is that makes a man fight. And when we fight, we get ugly. And when we fight, sometimes what we do is we bring race into it. and has no place in this argument. But we do it as human beings. And so, you know, um, I forget what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> the Why you went to the reading board and asked for that reading? I did, so yeah, I was at the, at the I didn't want to wall this movie off to people under 17 years old. I wanted them to see because the best chance we have of working through this is our children. I grew up and I said those words. I grew up around them. They were ugly. And my children don't even think about that. My children, like Mike said, my children are better than I am. And their children are gonna be better than them. And that's the world that can be inherited. And so I didn't want it walled off to them. I didn't want to make a movie that had cookie cutter characters in them. We all have people in our family, you know, that, 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 that fall off on the end. My, my addiction was just as bad as Reggie's. I tell, I think Mike wrote a beautifully even-handed movie. And when you think about that little girl playing her piano in my house? How boring, right? The little metronome's going. But when she went down to Compton and played music, she had all her brothers and sisters and cousins. And Elliot saw that, and he saw that she could, she's loved down there. She's safe down there. And we have a lot of suspicions in our life. And Octavia says it beautifully. You, we, we have different versions about what's safe. And I love what Mike was able to do. He made it even-handed. I tell Reggie to get his act together, and then I go over and go, look, 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 look. <laughs> I thought that was genius in Mike's writing. The goal, well, the goal, the, can you say that again? <laughs> um, the goal of the movie was so that you, don't, you think, okay, I want this little girl with this guy. No, no, I, no, 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 no. So, you, you, so, cause, you know, and you don't really know. And, and you take the journey. And, that, and I think that that's something that I'm really happy when I watch with audiences. You feel them doing that. I want to talk for a moment about your performance. Uh, and I want to talk both to you about it first, but then I want to hear Mike too as the director on how this was achieved. What I think is extraordinary about this performance is, this is going to sound odd, but it's both restrained and out there at the same time. Right? And uh, years ago, I had the privilege of meeting Jackie Gleason uh, briefly. And, and one of the things we talked about was how difficult it is to play a drunk. 
that when you have alcohol, people want to be sloppy, they want to fall down. And here you were playing a drunk, but it was very strange. He wasn't going to admit he was a drunk. He wasn't going to admit he had a problem, but it meant that you as an actor had to both show that you were drunk and show that you weren't going to let anybody know you were drunk at the same time. Tell me how you achieved that. Well, um, I don't really drink. I drank in college, and I didn't drink after that. Um, I don't. I don't drink alcohol with meals. I don't drink them socially. I uh, so trying to craft the performance. Um, I try to you know find those nuances of when I watch people and when I and I you know you layer the idea of anger on top of that. You layer the idea of, of fear because let's make no mistake. This is a man who, who realizes. He's going to have to comb this little girl's hair the rest of her life. And that's, that's not only a responsibility, there's also a joy in that, to have that kind of connection. And so, you know, I, try to, I just try to embrace the whole thing. Look at, I knew it was a good part. I paid for it. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's a fine line uh, because at the same time you're trying to convince a judge and convince the world you should have this little girl or your character trying to convince them, you're also continuing to drink which even your own lawyer is saying is the wrong thing to do here. So it was very challenging, wasn't it? I think Mike, I, that, but these are all Mike's inventions. I, I, actors aren't any good without great words. And um, I'm pretty charming at my own house. <laughs> but for two hours, you know, on a screen, you have to be given something that's special. And all too often it's not. Uh, it's serviceable. This felt special, and I and I am uh, very very grateful. I uh, we don't know what's going to happen when we all drive away from here and go home and go lay our heads down on our pillow. We just simply don't know what life brings us. But if I never made another movie, I would be really happy that this was my last movie. It would service what I feel about movies, what I feel about love, what I think about family. So this was an important movie for me in a lot of ways, and. Um, you know, I, I, if I'm good at anything, it's not letting go of something I love. And, and, I'm, and, and, and people can't talk me out of what I love. Mike Kevin is uh, complimented you. Definitely listen to applause. Mike uh, Kevin has complimented you on the writing, but I want you to put on your director's hat for a moment. You were the guy sitting on the other side of the camera when he had to give that performance. What was it like to direct that, and, and how did you and he work together? Oh, we worked together before. I understand. And, and, uh, and uh, he mentioned Spencer Tracy. I not only am I a big, big Kevin Costner fan, I've always been, but that I think he's kind of like Spencer Tracy, who I always loved when I was a kid too. Seeing his movies on TV late at night because he just never felt like he was acting. You know, he just always felt I just he just his characters are performances really just felt so believable and they breathed reality in me, you know, and, and so Kevin, in this particular part, honestly, I, there wasn't a lot of directing. There was just a lot of talking and just kind of going, yeah, you're in the right zone, just stay there, man. And, you know, he, he comes very prepared, more than pretty much any actor I've ever worked with. He, 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 comes to work, he knows his lines, he knows them backwards, he knows them, he knows ev what every word means, you know, he, one of the things that bothers him, and I learned very early on in our first movie working together, he doesn't like it when I come to the set and go, hey, I rewrote this thing last night, take a look at it. Go, no, you didn't. I've been working on this thing for 48 hours straight, don't rewrite it. You know, some actors like that. But Kevin doesn't like that. And, 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 and I, I understand that, why? Because once he's done all that preparation, then he just can inhabit it. So I really didn't do much directing. I was just there kind of going, yeah, you didn't, you're not hitting tilt, so keep going, you know? You know I have a lot of questions. I'm going to ask another one in a moment. But I just want to tell all of you folks that in a few minutes, we are going to open it up for some questions. And I want you to be thinking about what questions you want to ask. Not quite yet, but pretty soon. Very in other soon. words, there's going to be a test. <laughs> I want to ask you about the racial content here, because we live in a time that's almost explosive in terms of race relations. Uh, roles that used to be 50 years ago have completely changed now. People are very sensitive. 
even in this movie, the use of the N-word, the one time, becomes an issue uh, for the whole thing. When you were dealing with this, did you have concerns about how it was going to play on, uh, among different races, and how did you address that? Was that all my writing? I didn't have one concern about it. I, maybe I'm like the mongoose with the cobra. You know, I don't know that I'm in danger. But listen, when I put Whitney Houston in the bodyguard, I did because I thought she was the prettiest girl I'd seen in a long time. Um, and I really meant that, you know. I, so I thought that this, this was the right girl for us. And, um, you know, and so people who thought that was very brave or adventurous, I almost, I almost didn't know really what they were talking about. I thought, well, we're going to take the cute one right here who can sing. You know, <laughs> duh. You know, you know so to, to, me, to me, that, you know, uh, uh, you know the, uh, it, it, I, don't, I don't feel that. I feel like the danger is ignoring the danger. You just go ahead on at it. You, you do. There was nothing wrong. Everybody in this room understood what happened. I'm confident in the audiences. I'm confident in, 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 in what can be said. You know, I'm confident in love, because love, at the end of the day, triumphed in this movie. These were two families that loved this little girl. And they really came to know that they didn't have to be that suspicious of each other. And um, where they got into trouble was that their suspicions were founded, but not founded in race. They're just founded on suspicions, you know? Um, and. Uh, so, I, uh, I don't worry about the audience. I worry when we try to please audiences. That really bugs me. Yeah, it's a, you know, let a movie end the way it ends. I, I like a happy ending as well as anybody. I do. But if an ending is not going to be happy, what I require is that I have a high understanding of why it ended the way it did. And when I have a high understanding of anything in life, I can almost tolerate anything. When I don't understand something, so I don't understand movies where they shouldn't end happy, and they do. That bugs me. <laughs> well, you know, I think... Uh, Whitney, I just want to say one thing. Whitney and I should not have ended up together in Bodyguard, and that's why that movie was more successful and more beloved. It would have made no sense, because her life was going to go this way, and mine as a bodyguard was going to go this way. And if we wanted to try to make a happy ever after movie with, with Bodyguard, it would have been a failure. The fact that she went off and sang that little country song in an acapella and it cut back to me, everybody understood that there was romance there. There was love there. But that relationship never would have worked in a million years. And that was a more honest ending. It was a beautiful movie. I want to ask you a similar question. In terms of you said you lived through this, so I know that you understand how explosive these issues can be. And it's not just a matter of race. It's also a matter of socioeconomics, that when you have wealthy people and people who aren't as wealthy, there's going to be a lot of butting of heads, whatever the races are. When you were writing this, how important was it to you to get that right? Well, when, when my nephew, Sean, was a kid, you know, he, he would be down in South Central with his family and up with us, and everyone there, people would always talk about him, oh, he's black or he's white or he's half. He didn't see himself as that. He was just a little kid, you know, and he just knew that he was loved by two families and he felt very loved, you know, and I, I really think that was what I tried to write the little girl as and the story as, and, you know, and uh, to me, his character really, you know, he, he's worried be about her safety because he thinks Rowena lives in a blind spot like many mothers do, not just black mothers. Mothers, not white mothers, just mothers. That, that, that my own wife, sometimes with my son, I say, he's pulling so much wool over your eyes, you don't even know. I have a 20 year old son, he can, he can talk my wife into anything. And he understood that and he said, my problem is you aren't re being realistic about where your son's at. And it had nothing to do with it. It had nothing to do with socioeconomic money. It had to do with just, you know, I'm worried because you're not worried. All right, well, let's see if we can find a couple of questions here. Uh, hard to see in the light, but I see a gentleman right here. Do you want to get us started? We're ready for another Costner Western. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay. He's ready for another Western. Me too. <laughs> Is that right there? Thank you. Oh, yeah, I just want to say, wow, this movie, I was taken back because I didn't expect this. I mean, well, you're a big star, Kevin, so I knew you were, it was going to be good. That's why it came. But when I looked and I, and I mean, it was touching. I mean, I don't even cry, and I was crying in this movie. Honestly, this movie had everything. It was funny. You had all the elements. I mean, it was great. Everybody was cheering. Even for, it, it was, it brought, it addressed all the issues on both sides. It brought up all the, the stereotypes and all the people's feelings, and it was, it was a great piece of work. And this thing is going to make it big. I know it is, and I'm happy that I was one of the first people to see it. Well, you know. hope the Academy Thank you. Are still the same way. Everybody yeah. heard you anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ben. My name is Lisa. My brother's name is Moses. Anyway, he played baseball. Talking into a Talking into a microphone. Yeah. 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 Y
She she won the role. Kevin said it best. You know, she this girl won that role. She did a big search. We saw. I, I would say our casting director saw a thousand kids, and then we went. I would. I probably saw fifty or a hundred. And I watched a lot of tapes, and I Kevin and I probably watched five or six, and then we met two or three, and. She came up to New York, she flew up to New York, and he was, I forget what, he was shooting something. We, 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 we doing draft day. You were doing draft day, that's right. And, um, and uh, we met her with her mother, and um, you know, she won the role. Kevin, when she walked in the room in New York, what was it about her that made you say, that's the one? I didn't say it, because our movie depended on her being good. So, you know, there's a lot of people that look the part but can't play it. And we really needed, we needed what she did, it was that little magic of touching my face, of reaching up and giving that kiss, of, you know, um, we needed to be able to trust each other, and so I could hug her and kiss her, and we had a really strong level of trust, I don't know if it's because I had kids or what, but we needed for her to be good, and she was. Okay, uh, one or two more Kevin? questions. Kevin? Uh, sorry, to the right. Over here. Okay. Um, so being a family man yourself, you're just talking about your kids, I'm really interested to know how your children or family might have influenced you while preparing for this role and having a family man helped you. I was wondering the same thing. How did having a family of your own, having raised children, impact how you approached this role and what this role meant to you? Well, there's a couple things here for real. Um, um, I've had this is I've, I've had two families. I was uh, married for 20 years and divorced and had three children. I waited about seven, eight years, and I didn't think love was going to come to me a second time, but it did. And um, I've been together with my wife for 15 years, and we have three young children, four, five, and seven. And um, the biological thing that we're all facing means that I won't get to see some of the big events in their life. Their marriages maybe, like I will my first three. Uh, I remember my, my first three being a little bit jealous of, on some level, you know, of how to, there's a little confusion when you have two families. Do you love us as much as you love these three little babies that have just come in? And I said, of course. And, and I said, you never have to worry about this. Think about what you've had. You've had a lifetime with me. They're only going to get a third of that. And it sobered my older children. Um, so reality hits me the way it hits you. But the one thing that I'll have with these children is sometimes they're going to be able to look back at these movies. And they're going to go, Dad was young. <laughs> he was strong. There's a lot of things that they'll be able to see. And, uh, you know, they'll be able to have black or white. And I'm very conscious of the movies I try to make. They're not all going to be about this. You know, if you're wondering about this shitty haircut I have, it's because I just played a criminal. <laughs> okay, so now we got the elephant out of the room. <laughs> it's starting to grow back. It'll be okay. But uh, can I also just mention real quick that that's Kevin's daughter who is singing in the church. Lily was a really talented hero. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, yeah. And I, saw, I, saw, I saw her on a YouTube video, someone showed it to me because there was another guy that was going to do it. And I said, Kevin, I said, your daughter's amazing. Let's, what about her for that? And she, I thought she did a great job. But, listen, I, the, the best thing I have is, is my family. I've been blessed to be able to make a career of making movies. Movies aren't the only thing in my life. They don't define who I am. But I have been privileged to make them, go around the world, take nothing from the areas I visited except the pictures. So um, I feel really lucky to have made movies, and I'm really glad that, um, uh, that you've uh, enjoyed this one tonight. Sincerely, thank you. Kevin, I have a question. Kevin, I have a question over here. I'm all right. Um, now, when you were a Hollywood icon and piggybacking off of your answer just now, how has uh, your wife supported you with what makes your love and relationship last so long? She's asking, uh, how has your wife supported you? As you said, 
he financed this movie. It became quite a personal thing. And uh, yeah, well, I, she, my wife does one thing that's pretty interesting because when I have to make a decision about something, sometimes it t can take me away from her. I try to have my family travel with me. But one of the very interesting things she does as a partner is that she doesn't include herself in the decision at first. She trusts that I'm going to do the math on where I have to go. So if I think that I want to do something, she doesn't ever start with, yeah, but what about us? That means you're going to be here, and we're going to be here, and we're going to be. She's always embraced what I've done as an artist. And she starts with, why is this important to you? Why is it important to us? She trusts then, after um, I give that answer, that I will go off on my own and try to decide how do I weigh that against how my family has to operate on a day-to-day -day level. So, listen, I don't have a perfect life. It, you know, there are bumps and bruises and, you know, life, I have taken a big bite out of life, and but I will tell you for sure, life has taken a big bite out of me too a couple times. It's put me on the floor. But, um, you know, I have a partnership and we try to talk it out. And, and uh, you know, it, 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 for me to present it as if it's rosy, it's not, but when it, got, when it gets tough, my wife said, you really want to make this movie? That, she didn't talk about our level of security at all. She didn't talk about where we're going to get it back. She just said, if that's what you want to do, I kind of know the man I married, and I kind of know how you are. And for me, that's, that's a pretty good partner. That's a pretty good partner. Can I have a question Yeah, go last. Hi, um, I, I think the movie you guys made is just powerful. As a parent who's, who's gone through some of those issues, it, it really did touch me. And I have a side question, this is coming from our son. We spent two years constantly watching Waterworld. Mm -hmm. Our son loves, and so was it, was it a fun movie to make? Um, our, our fortune, I want to know. Yeah, yeah. Waterworld or this one? Yeah, Waterworld. Waterworld. Waterworld, it was, a, it's a, it was a really fun movie to make. It came at a very difficult time in my life, but. It's a very beloved movie around the world. And I stood behind Waterworld the same way I stand behind Black and White. Not that it's a perfect movie, but um, I don't run from the things I make. And that movie is, is beloved around the world. And it's hard for people to realize that it made not only some money, but it made a lot of money. People have a difficulty ever printing that. So I have to live with that. But uh, I love making that movie. and. Uh, it's interesting because it's famously, in the technical sense, I understood, a very difficult movie to make. It was a very, very difficult, movie. very difficult to make. Boy, it was hard being in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> but when you shoot out the water, it, it's always a, it's a challenge. No, it, it's a, it feels impossible. But um, look, man, I've had a chance to ride with Buffalo. This people haven't been able to do for 150 years. The movies have given me... You know, I pitched the perfect game in Yankee Stadium. Let's not forget. Uh, the movies have afforded me just so much. And people around the world have treated me great because of it. And, um, and uh, these are some of the things I'll take with me the rest of my life, how I've been treated, and even how I've been treated tonight. Thank you. Uh, one last question, and then we're going to wrap up. Who do you got? Okay, I have one quick one. Um, Anthony Mackey and uh, Octavia Spencer, they're very strong individuals aside from being actors and actress. What was their input to what they were reading, what they were going to perform? Did they have any personal um, situations that they might have brought to? So she's the asking if uh, Octavia Spencer or Anthony Mackey or for that matter any of your key players That's uh, a good question. influenced the... A lot, a lot. They had a lot of input. And, you know, and they understood the script, and the script spoke to them in a way. And they, you know, those are two incredible actors, and, and um, you know, especially Octavia, she really got the script and the story. And she, I, I can't imagine anyone else playing that role with her. You know? I want to do one final thing, if we may, and I know we're stretching the time here, but I believe this is, movie is, is going to have lasting power and that sometime well beyond my lifetime, maybe hundreds of years from now or longer, somebody's going to put a DVD or the equivalent into a player. They're going to watch this movie, and then the DVD extras, they're going to see this scene. And I want each of you briefly to say something to those people who watch that movie a few hundred years from now. Mike first. 
few hundred years from now? Or more. Just see if we're getting the residuals on that. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> just, you know, I just want to say hello to my great, great grandchildren. <laughs> I hope you guys are doing well. And um, now, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't know. It's a really good question. You make movies that will travel through time. I said one thing that I don't want to live by what happens on a movie on opening weekend, but a movie that's willing to be passed generation to generation, that's a hit movie. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in a big round of applause for Mike and Kevin and for this great movie. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks to AARP. And we'll see you all again.